Welcome to St. Joseph Evangelization Network. We're here continuing our ongoing series of Men on a Mission. And today we're going to be speaking with Leslie Farr, and we're going to be talking about who, God willing, will be a great saint someday, Father Augustine Tolton, a great man who is just in the beginning of the process towards sainthood. We're going to talk about what that process is, who this man is, and why you should know him. Stay tuned. It's not easy being a Catholic in today's world. Moral relativism is so pervasive that we often struggle to be the people of faith who God created and calls us to be. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus equips the apostles with the simplest tools of the trade, a walking stick, a tunic, and sandals. They don't need anything else because they have the power of Christ to sustain them. In the same way, God also calls each of us to share in the mission of evangelization. Friends, let's stop making excuses for not living our faith. As witnesses of God's kingdom on earth, equipped with the spirit of knowledge and the desire to do God's will, let us boldly proclaim our Catholic faith in what we say and how we live. Welcome back. This is St. Joseph Evangelization Network, Men on a Mission. I'm your host today, Peter Kruitz, and we are here with Leslie Farr. Leslie, thank you so much for coming. Oh, no problem. Man. And talking about this great man who you need to know, Father Augustine Tolton. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you a few things that you might not know. Uh, Father Augustine, uh, he's black, and he grew up a slave, and he was a priest in um, in. Illinois, yes, Quincy, Quincy, and then moved to Chicago. And his cause is right now progressing through uh, sainthood, yeah, I guess. The canonization process. Canonization yes. process. So, so you need to know, tell me a little bit about Father, but then you, you got to get into, <clears throat> what does it take to be a saint? What, what are the processes? But tell me a little bit about Father. I think everybody knows him, but maybe we don't, just a little so, bit. So, I mean, the basics, just a quick rundown. Father Tolton was born into slavery in 1854. Um, went on to Rome to study in seminary and then became a priest. Um, thought he was going to go to Africa to be a priest, but then at the 11th hour was sent back to Quincy to become a priest. And so that's a little bit of the start yeah. of it. Um, and and, and the, to be yeah, obvious, I mean, so, I mean, what are the reasons he, wasn't, he couldn't do his study here in the United States? Is that the, Quite frankly, they wouldn't allow this black man who was a slave right. to go into seminary. Right. But that's not unique. That's happened all over the world with certain prejudices and government problems. It doesn't stop a man from being a priest, right? Right, yeah. So, I mean, in the trip back to Italy and then the studies and then once upon completion, he then comes back to Quincy, and he, he he not his idea, by the way. No, no, and he and you know, and it takes off because he's an amazing man. Um, his ministry just takes off everywhere he goes, and in Quincy, so he um, then uh, some of the priests get a little bit jealous, like, hey, this guy's because he was popular with black and white Catholics, and so they were like, well, hold up, and they <laughs> went to the bishop of that time, the diocese of Alton, right? Uh -huh. So how the world shifted, right? The diocese of Alton. How about and, that? And um, the bishop says, no, you can only minister to black folks, and then he so then he transfers to Chicago, where the where we really pick him up right. as the person he truly. Um, became so he's right now at the venerable stage of the process. So, so we're, we're, how's the process uh, start? In other words, if if uh, one of us are going to be a saint, we all will be, hopefully, God willing. But so, what? Where does that process start? Of course, so, I I heard about this man years before there was any ever a cause for sainthood. But now, what's that first step? So what? that so the first step is someone must recommend you to a bishop. And then that bishop then does his own investigation into you, determines whether or not you're viable to start the process, and then the bishop nominates you. And then we call this the servant of God portion because that's the title you're given. Step one. Step one, servant of God. The bishop has deemed you viable for the process, meaning that he believes there's something there worth 
you continuing the process. And then we get into the venerable process, which is a little bit more difficult because now you're all of your information, all of the things about you, that's now shifted to the Vatican. And you are assigned someone to represent you, in this case, Bishop Perry for Father Tolton. And your life is then investigated, analyzed, and contextualized um, by this body called the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. And then... Um, what a nice word. Yeah, and so you have to have this heroic virtue. Yeah. And which is just basically earnestly and aggressively seeking to advance your religious life. And so once this congregation decides that you have in fact met everything that they believe is necessary, you then move on to the next step, which now you're venerable, and that's where Father Toten is, but then we get to the blessing. And let's, let's pause there for a second. This is not an easy process. No, no. Yeah. And, this and, could... and you, hear, you talked about the name of the congregation. It sounded very nice, right? The yeah. congregation of the cause of sin. You got to remember the old name. The old name was the devil's advocate because yeah. it, was, it was a scrutiny. I mean, you're yeah, not reading yeah. all the nice things about him, but they are really looking to make sure that they know this man. Well, they don't. Good and bad, <clears throat> right? Well, they don't just investigate you, right? Because it's easy to just investigate you. They investigate the people around you right. and what they say about you. And then it's kind of a consider the source thing. So, right, if, if maybe, I, maybe someone who's not as reliable of a source says, he was the best person in the world. Right. You yeah. know, they come back and say, well, you know, that person's not really reliable. Right. And, and so they're not, they're not only investigating you, they're investigating you, the people around you, the circumstances around yeah. you. Because like Father Tolton was up against extreme circumstances. Absolutely. Where you're in a place and time where many of the people around you don't believe you have a soul and shouldn't be baptized at all. So yeah. like you're, you're really being scrutinized. And so then you move on to the blessed phase, which becomes a little bit more, well, a lot more difficult because now you're working and that you have to have a miracle attributed to you. And it's, it's not just a miracle of, you know, like, hey, Joe Montana scored four touchdowns in two minutes. Kansas it's, City won. It, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that the church, so to legitimate a miracle, the... Um, Church, it has to both be spontaneous and enigmatic, meaning it's mysterious and it can't be easily explained. And it can't just, you know, come from um, something that's simple or long. Like if I had the flu and I got better in three weeks and we prayed about yeah. it, that's not spontaneous. Enigmatic means, yeah. it, it, I've even heard it go even beyond that. So it is unexplainable. Right. It, it, can't make sense right. of it and so, whatsoever. So to understand how they determine a miracle, like this is not just something like you were asked, wow, you know that was miraculous. They actually call in scientists. And uh, many times... Good Catholic these, scientists, yeah, right? No, no. Sometimes these scientists aren't even... A, they call in people who would say, like they're looking for a reason to say, no, 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 no. Absolutely. No, that's explainable. Yeah. So they call in a group of people and experts, and these experts deem it, hey, there's no way that this can be physically or scientifically explained away. And then once you've met that, now you're blessed. Got it. Um, and then we get into the part when once you become blessed, they start the search for another miracle. Um, and to get to sainthood, you have to have a second miracle attributed to you. Um, at least one more. And then the Pope it's all presented to the Pope, and the Pope determines whether or not the person is actually, is if this rises to the cause of sainthood. Now, it's, it's so we sometimes have to remember that some of these folks go centuries. Oh, absolutely. Like yeah. centuries yeah. before yeah. they right. are even considered. Yeah. So, you know, like, it, it, so we think in the case of like someone like Mother Teresa, because she was just unusual, unusually oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So this, her process is relatively short because like, well, I mean, for me, I witnessed it. Like I, I witnessed a lot of it. So it's easy to say, oh, well, then it should be that short. It is not. It's usually very long. And I think that because of her being amazing, an amazing person, we don't realize what the process really is. Right. And so, like, to understand this, Father Tolton, his life was just amazing, right? So you're, you're nine years old, and everyone in your family is now gone through death. He lost his entire right. family yeah. by the time he was nine. Yes. Wow. And so, like, you're... 
you 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 realize that studying father told him that his parents so they were born in Kentucky and um they were the, his parents were made gifts they were to, slaves just yeah, to they put were slaves. Bluntly, yeah they were slaves and they were made gifts when the daughter got married to the this family and that's how he ended up in Rawls County Missouri because his fan his parents were a, his well his mother was a gift to the daughter of the former slave master and so like understanding that and the real struggles and quarrels behind that and, and just understanding who he is and how he learned he came to learn as a as a young slave he learned how to read and write he was baptized because the, of the type of family that the Elliots were. I, 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 I don't want to glance that by, but um, and maybe I'm misinformed, but was it reasonably uncommon for a slave? To it learn? was. It was. So a lot of the slave masters, including the Catholics, I don't, I don't want to make sense, oh, the Catholics were so nice. Right. A lot of the slave masters considered the slaves soulless. So they would uh -huh. not baptize them. Really? Um, so for a slave to be baptized in itself was a very rare thing. Um, and even the family would bring in a priest to serve mass to the slaves at times was something even different because many people consider slaves soulless. Yeah. They were just properties, no more. I mean, you wouldn't take your dog to church and they would, yeah. Yeah. like for lack of better terms, um, yeah. that you wouldn't take your dog to church. Yeah. So why would you take your soulless slave to church or even have your soulless slave minister yeah. to? Hard, hard conversations, but we need to know our right. history. Right. Yeah. And it tells us a little bit, it informs us a little bit of the world the Father Augustus lived in and through. Right, yeah, I mean, just think about the fact that he was unable to go to seminary in the United States, not because he was a bad person or he was unworthy of seminary, simply because the, he lived in a world and a time and a place in the United States' history where blacks were not allowed. They weren't deemed worthy enough or humane enough to go to any of these places. So, I mean, just the fact that he had the wherewithal and the and the drive and the continuation to say, okay, well, this is something I really want. And so he went to Rome. And despite all of that, the church saw that he was uh, had a true vocation and the church was not going to be bound by or inhibited by that particular problem. So the church sent him well, to Rome. So you have to understand the history of the world too. So being a, being a history major, Europe was maybe a little bit better placed to handle a black slave because they had been dealing with Africa for a long time. There were Africans flowing freely throughout Europe. In many of those countries, by 1854, slavery had been outlawed for at least a century or more. Oh, is that right? So you have to remember that they're, they're much more equipped. Uh, there had been, there were three African popes at the beginning of the Catholic Church. So. Europe, Italy, the church itself, the world was a little bit more ready to deal with a person of color seeking the priesthood because they were a little bit freer society things. I don't want to say they were perfect. I mean, they certainly had their moments, but they were a little bit freer society, a little bit more advanced down the, up the social ladder than we were. I think by that time, the Pope had issued just an outright you cannot participate in the slave trade. Right. Dick, yeah. uh, edict, and, and that was accepted by most Catholics in yeah. Europe, not in the United States. So. Well, Leslie, this, this first segment has flown by. We're going to do another segment. We're going to talk a little bit more about the spirituality of Father Augustine Tolton. Uh, we've learned a little bit about the canonization process. We'll touch on that again a little bit. Uh, and maybe we'll even talk about the first Black Pope, which again, a little bit of trivia, you said there's three. Anyway, so there's a lot more to come. The spirituality of Father Augustus Tolton in this next segment. Come back, don't go away, and tell a friend about this too. Would you please? See you in a few minutes.
This segment of Men on a Mission is made possible through the generosity of affordable kitchens and baths. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Welcome back to St. Joseph Evangelization Network. This is our ongoing series, Men on a Mission. Today we're with Leslie Farr and we're talking about Father Augustine Tolton. If you don't know him, stick, stick to us, watch us. We're going to talk about his spirituality. Our segment just before, we talked about the canonization process and a little bit about him. In this segment, we're going to get to know him a little bit deeper. And Leslie Farr is here to tell us about him. Leslie, good to have you here. Well, Leslie and I know each other fairly well. We're both Knights of Columbus. We're both Knights, Knights of Peter Claver. Well. And uh, if you don't know who the Knights of Peter Claver is, you know, I hope you have the internet. Look it up. We'll have another segment and talk about that one day. But today, at this moment, we're talking about Father Augustus Tolton. His canonization process is, shall we say, really moving? Yeah, I think so. And yeah. as, as this goes, it, it's moving fairly quickly. Um, but he's a person worthy of it. I mean, this, this is a person dedicated. He only had 13 years in the priesthood, and, and roughly about And he died 13. young. He died at 43, so, um, and he died from, well, depending on who you ask, the, the official medical reasoning was a stroke. Um, but a he, stroke? Yeah, but he literally worked himself to death. Um, so it starts, he starts his priesthood in Quincy, it takes off. He um, he meets some difficulties in that his ministry takes off, and he's drawing both white and black Catholics. They're drawn to him. He's known. Sure. He's um, recorded as a great homilist, so people are drawn to him. He can really relate. I mean, he's got a life that really puts a lot of relatable situations together, and so. It takes off, and then Quincy, another priest, says, you know, guy's moving too fast. Let's uh, kind of tamp this down. Sounds so, like that sin of pride getting so, involved with uh, yeah. even here, yeah, with priests and whatnot. But. And so then he is then told by the Bishop of Alton, the Diocese of Alton, that he can no longer administer to white congregants. He can only administer to black congregants. So then he decides to make a transition to Chicago. And once he makes the transition to Chicago, he really starts to work. I mean, the, the stories are that he tirelessly works day and night, um, cleaning the church and then going out door to door and walking the streets of Chicago. Um, and in a time where like, so we think like Chicago now, we think in terms of now, but your big cities were havens of disease sure. and, and danger, right? So you didn't want to get involved with a lot of different people or meet a lot of different people because you could pick up something and that could carry on. But he administered and kept going and kept going. And um, just one day in 1897, he had returned from a retreat. Most people return energized. He just passed out and later died. I mean, that's, that's the man's story, but his, his story, his time is so short, but what he did is so amazing because he worked through a lot of social tension and a lot of different things that were going on at the time to have a very successful ministry and draw a lot of people into the church. Yeah, let's give uh, folks a little bit of a, a teaser on that. You know, there's another uh, man I just love. His name is Deacon Harold Burke Seavers, and if you haven't heard of him, you, you need to know him too. This is a book that he wrote on Augustine Tolton, and I'm just going to read a couple of the chapters in here. Uh, and it, one of them is Building Strong Families. 
right. ahead of his time. Uh, chapter five is uh, the culture of life sounds familiar, and the meaning of human suffering. I mean, those two topics in the one chapter uh, John Paul talked about extensively, the, you know, the culture of life and, and uh, Silvific Dolores, the meaning of suffering. I mean, coming from a slave, former slave, uh, I mean, the meaning of suffering, he knows where he was coming from. And then the power of prayer. So, so much of what he did, the reason why he resonated is that he got to the heart of spirituality. He got to the heart of who we are as men, as Catholics, as families. Uh, someone said recently that the demise of culture is really rooted in the demise of the family. The largest yeah. chapter in this book is building strong families. So, and I mean, I think he, so coming from the place that he did and realizing that his Catholic faith, although manifested in adulthood, was really started in his childhood. At, at baptism and then learning how to read from the Bible a little bit and then going on to Rome. So like thinking about it. So a lot of his focus is on building strong Catholic children and laying the foundation. So in, in today's date, we would call it laying the foundation. So it, it's one of those things like I, um, for, for example, for me in my life, the foundation was laid by my mother and father that you always go to church. So no matter what I did, I always went to church on That's Sunday right. morning. That's right. So it might have been like, oh, you know what? Hey, we were at this party. We we're at this party till 5 a.m. St. Kevin's has mass at 7. So we go. And it's crazy because the priest knew what we all had been doing. And he would offer us confession. He would offer us the opportunity. But it's that strong foundation from childhood that really laid that to, to resonate to today. So where do we lose most people in those late teen years? Yeah. Because they don't have that strong foundation. They don't have an understanding. So he was very big on going back to the children and making sure like, hey, you understand what, why we do this. You understand why we have this sacrament and what we do, how we do it, why we do it. You, you know that, going. man. You're so. spot on. I'm, I'm in the chapter. I'm building a strong family, and I'm, I'm going to hit the beginning of the last paragraph. It says, help them. We're talking about them, us. Help them to develop habits of making good choices to build spiritual muscle memory. And then he says, faith then becomes not just what we do, but who we are. Right. right, it develops those good, strong habits. He said he calls it muscle memory. Right, you you went to mass because that's what you're going to do, yeah. and that's what you had to do, and then it didn't become just what you did, but it became who you really are. Right, I mean, that resonates. That resonates. He, he, I could see how he would really speak to people of all sorts. Yeah, and so it's it's really getting into who he was that we learn, like okay. He was a foundation person. If you build a strong foundation, your house will last. And, and that's just it. You build a, what, what is it? If you build a house on, in, sand. In, on sand, it crumbles. Yeah. He was that person. He was the one who realized that it took the strong foundation. And once the foundation was laid, no matter what, the house would weather the storm. And, and, and I think that that's important to realize about who he was. Um, he certainly is not alone in this group of strong black Catholics from that kind of sort of era. You have Henriette DeLille, you have Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang and Pierre Toussaint all in their canonization processes respectively um, that came from there and they were all foundationed as children. They were all made strong in their faith as children and then it carried throughout their life. And I think like, that's a lesson for us today as Catholics. Like I meet so many parents who say, you know, hey, you know, we went to church and, you know, and, and now my, my children are of another faith. And it's really because you have to have a strong foundation. As a parent, I make sure like my child, my daughter goes to PSR and when my son's old enough, he's going to be in PSR and that we make sure they understand from top to bottom what we do and why we do it. And it's, it's beyond that whole Catholic of Father Toten would go back and, and do you have any questions? 
It's beyond that, well, this is, we're Catholic, that's just what we do. It's actually knowing what we do and why we do it. Like, for example, my daughter, um, one time she says, we're kneeling at church after Eucharist, and she says, well, why do you wait so long when everyone get, else gets up? And I says, well, you know, we're supposed to remain kneeling because we're in the presence of God, and when you're in the presence of God, until the host is returned to the tabernacle, you're in the presence of God. And she's like, Oh. oh, and so then she's like telling everybody, like right, so like other people are getting up. She's like, no, no, you can't, yeah. you can't get up because we're in the presence. Of God. Making sure they understand what we do and why we do it. There you go, and that's the second thing that uh, Father Tolton said. Yeah. He said, teach children. Just don't assume they know. Yeah. Teach children, and then give them strengths and and ways to, as he says, fight the allure of sin and disordered desires by asking God and the Blessed Mother to help them to pray, right? To, to ask, we have the right as children of God, sons of the King, to pray and ask. And, and then Father goes on to say, um, by saying the Hail Mary to, at the times of temptation, by asking Jesus and Mary to be with them at these moments, by praying the St. Michael, uh, Michael prayer and asking for the intercession of the saints. I mean, that's what you're talking about. You're, you're right. teaching your children the what to do, who we are and why we do it, and giving them help. It isn't just a mechanical thing. It's where we are moving our children in life, away from sin, toward holiness, and, and telling them why we do it. I mean, how powerful. You told your children, clearly and truthfully, you're in the presence of God. We're not just kneeling because we're told. We're kneeling because we're in the presence of God. Right, yeah. And, 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 and but, you know, we, some of us grew up in a church where it was, Hey, this is just what we do as Catholics. And then you lose the reason why, and it becomes, yeah, absolutely. And it just becomes then it just becomes some dumb thing we do as Catholics. Yeah. And it makes it easier just right. to walk away from the church because this is just some dumb thing we do as Catholics. And, well, I'm not going to go there and do that dumb stuff anymore because, you know, it, it just, I, I can do other stuff because this is just stupid. Yeah. Right? And once we learn, like, why we do it and and what's so important about it, like, you know, Hey, like joking with my daughter, and I and I always joke with her, and it goes, you know, you know, Easter Sunday is not a holy day of obligation. Uh, and she goes, she goes, well, yes, it is, and no, it's not. Easter is just Easter, yeah. because all Sundays are holy days of That's obligation. That's right. So you made her think. Yeah, like, right. So like, no one realizes that <laughs> Easter right. is just Easter. That's right. It's but Sunday. all Sundays are holy days of yeah. obligation, and she's like, oh, really? So like, yeah, all Sundays are like Christmas, so we have to go. Now, at our house, it varies because my daughter's involved in sports now, and she's getting better, and so that means she travels. There's lots of bit. different yeah. masses at different times. And so, times. yeah, so sometimes that's 5 p.m. on yeah. Saturday. Sometimes that's 7 a.m. on Sunday. Sometimes we get to go to regular mass. It's 1030, but it's it is what it is. finding that time and showing, like, this is why it's important. And that resonates with her. Like, she, she gets on me on some of those Sundays when I'm like, Look, I just got back in town and I am tired. And she's like, Nah, Daddy, we we gotta go to church. We gotta go. And it's like she'll drag me to church. And I'm like, Come on, do we really? Well, like, I'll tell you, Leslie, what we're cool. doing. We talked. We said we we're gonna talk about the spirituality of Father Augustine Tolton, and that is exactly what we did. We as fathers, we as family, and building a great family yeah. for our children and for the church. Uh, this is Leslie Farr. I'm Peter Karutz. And this book is written by Deacon Harold S uh, Sievers, who I absolutely love. Please get it and study more about Father Tolton and his cause for sainthood. We'll see you next time.